Well, good evening. It is great to join you this evening and carry on our series, Just Believe. Last week, we were right at the end of the chapter uh, of John, right at the end of the book. And this week, we're going back a little bit to John 14. So, Just Believe. I don't know about you, but uh, like it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Just Believe. Just believe, and it's like, all oh, right, it's that, that easy. But maybe, like me, it's not, you find it, it's not always that easy all the time. Especially when we look at these verses we're going to look at in a few minutes. Because in these verses, there's a lot going on. And in these verses, it says, um, if you believe in me, it goes on to say, and you'll see the verses in a few moments, it goes on then to say, if you believe in me, you'll do the same works as I, and even greater. So I don't know about you, but I have never fed the 5,000. Some days it feels like that in my house, but it's in fact two hungry, almost teenagers. I've never walked on water. I've never raised the dead. In fact, I have been told, don't you dare, Grattan, even attempt it at funerals I've taken, because apparently it'd be far too much paperwork. But this just believe is so challenging. And this, this, this chapter comes in, it starts with Jesus comforting his disciples. And if you don't know what's happening in this chapter, just let me give you a brief overview, which why, then it goes on to see why it's so crucial these verses become. So at the start of this chapter, Jesus has just said he's going to be, um, the chapter before, he's just said that he's going to die and Peter's going to betray him. So there's all the anxiety around that and everyone's like well Peter's already said not me Lord Jesus said before the clock, clock crows three times you will have betrayed me this has happened so Peter's probably feeling a little bit hurt and betrayed to be honest um, and then we have Jesus goes on to say in my father's house are many rooms and I'm going there to prepare a place for you a verse that perhaps you're familiar with he talks about that and then in the back of all of that then comes in these verses so this is the night before Jesus dies and as, it's, as this, these, these verses are happening, Jesus is saying, don't worry, the final whistle will not end. It is not the end. And I know we're in Euro season now, but the final um, whistle will not end when I die. That's not the end. In fact, that's just the beginning of a whole new thing in which you're going to be a part of it. This is not the end. This is very much the beginning of a new era. Just believe in me. And he's talking about just believe in me and what's happened. And I and honestly, it's going to be okay because when I go away, you're going to do even grace. I did. This is not the end of what we've started together here, lads. This is so much more. And he's given a little bit, or I imagine a little bit of like a rousing speech almost, um, obviously, uh, during half time. He's kind of been, come on, guys, this is not the end. You are going to do even greater. There is more in you, perhaps even when it gets to penalties. Uh, you know, it's, there's more in you. And this is the part where Jesus then says these verses. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. He's very much saying, believe me when I say I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe in me. Believe in the evidence of everything you've seen already. Believe in all that you've watched these past three years. And as you do, as you walk as I walk, as you, as you create disciples as I have done, you will do greater things than even I have done because I'm going to the Father. Verse 12 says this. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me do the work I have been doing, they will do even greater things than these. Now, growing up in a Pentecostal church, I was like, yes, even greater than Jesus, great. And there's a Pentecostal part of me that's like the old school. It's like, yes, we're going to see people raised from the dead. And we're going to, and I grew up hearing these stories, of the blind seeing, the, the lame leaping and and all these incredible stories and, and, and testimonies of the goodness of God. And there is a part of me that goes, yes, I want to see thousands saved in one day. Yes, I can't wait for the first time someone rises from the dead during a service that I'm in. But actually it challenges us to be even greater It's so much more than the, the big pa-da, everything is awesome kind of miracles. Because actually it challenges us in the ordinary every day. It's not just about these big things that are written about, but about what Jesus was doing. 
just as he walked on the journey. See, we often see the great things as the big things, but actually greatness is doing small things every day well. And today I want to just share with you three things that I believe Jesus did and he's calling us to as church. And the first one is this, defend the cause of the oppressed. So in Mark 5, 21 to 34, Jesus heals two people. He heals the woman with the issue of blood, catchy name she has there. And then he heals Jairus' daughter, who also doesn't even have a name. But when he, he um, heals the woman with the issue of blood, it's in the middle of a crowd. He sees somebody who's oppressed. He sees, he encounters her when she's been rejected. She's an outcast. She's been ripped off by the doctors. She's been rejected by society. She's unclean. She's now in the margins. But Jesus defends her cause. And she, if she's found out in that place, as some of you would know, she would be, like that would be an ultimate punishment. But she's so desperate that if she can just reach Jesus, something will change. And Jesus knows she's there because she touches him. And he says, who touched me? Now, the disciples haven't got their big vision glasses on that day. They're in a, come on, Jesus, time is money, crack on. I'm imagining that was possibly Judas. But they're all, they're on to the next thing. Come on, we need to go and, like this Jairus' daughter, he's a nice man. Let's go and get his, his daughter healed. That'll be a good news story. And Jesus stops. Jesus stops and this woman is healed. His eyes see, he's trained to decode. He knows to defend the cause of the oppressed. He knows to defend, the, he knows that that's part of the good things, the great things that he will do. And that's what we're called to. We're called to every day just believe and open our eyes. Open our eyes rather than rushing through the day, rather than have the next priority thing, rather than like, hey, but there's this nice person over here, Jairus, nice man, let's go and meet with him. Rather than that, maybe God's calling us to the fringes. Do you know in this story, there was blood, it was messy, but instantly as Jesus is allowed to connect, there is order, there is wholeness. And the great things God calls us to is to create spaces where he can minister, where through us he works and there is wholeness in people's lives. We're called not necessarily to the nice places, but to defend the cause of the widow and the orphan and to see the oppressed. What would it look like if where we're at we started to look and not see those that are shoving around us, but see those who are desperate to reach Jesus and need us to open our eyes to the great things God could do in their lives. The second thing is this, speak hope. Speak hope. It's really interesting, you know, I've kind of referenced the fact a couple of times that part of what I do is take funerals. And uh, do you know, in those moments, I have two options when I take a service, especially if it's not a Christian service. I can choose to speak hope, not in a false sense, or I can choose to be negative and just dirge. And one of the things people often say is, you're the one who lifts the room. And that is an incredible testimony, not to me, but to the God who lives and works through me on the planet. Because there are moments when I feel like perhaps there is no hope. There are moments where I sit and see and I stand and tell a story of somebody and I'm looking to young children younger than mine and a young mum has died, perhaps 10 years younger than me. And I'm sharing stories and talking about how a mother's arms are safe and trying to encourage these children. And as I'm encouraging these children, I'm saying, it's gonna be okay. This is why it's gonna be okay. And I have a choice to make in those moments. And my choice is this. Can I speak hope? Yes, I can. Because here's the thing, and I don't, I don't know um, how much you know of the Bible, but in John 11, 43, it's the story of Lazarus and Jesus' friend dies. And Jesus' friend is somebody who he loves, loves, loves so passionately. He loves with an everlasting, he's like, he's just, this is his close friend. And he sees his friends, Mary and Martha, in grief, and he sees his friend has died. 
And in that moment, he pray, he weeps, he prays, and then he says this, Lazarus, come forth. See, the great thing that you're called to, the good fruit, the good thing that you're called to is this. Perhaps never to speak to a dead person physically and say, come forth, and we all have mummy, mummy's jumping around. But perhaps the speak hope is the dead relationships it's the dead, um, the stories, the debt, the issues that face people's lives, the anxiety. You and I, more than ever right now, we're called to speak hope right where we are. Right where you're going tomorrow, right where you're at right now to speak hope. Do you know, I often am heard to say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And you know, that comes from daily spending time with God and just knowing God is on the throne and I can speak hope and I can believe in a God who's, who heals and he can work through me. And I can speak hope in a season when we're not entirely sure where, where it's all gonna go this year. We're not entirely sure if the third wave's happening, but hey, the Euros are happening, so things are looking good. But we choose to speak hope. What would it look like if you spoke hope? What a great thing it would be doing if you spoke hope in every situation. If we were known as Christians who spoke life and said, come forth to the potential what's in people's lives. And three, number three is this, welcome others. And I love this. So Jesus is holding a banquet. Jesus prepared this banquet. He's not gate crashed somebody else's. He's sorting the food out. He's hospitable. He welcomes others. And I love this. The Pharisees say this. Um, they, I'm looking down so I make sure I get it right. The Pharisees say this. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He actually talks about how he welcomes tax collectors as well. So Jesus has these tax collectors and sinners and he eats with them, which is the ultimate, like for them, offensive thing. But he welcomes others. Jesus calls us to hospitality. The great things he calls us to are to open our arms and extend our tables. So often the, the narratives in the New Testament with Jesus are all around food, feeding the 5,000 food. Most of the major things Food, we have the feeding of the 4,000. He goes to Mary and Martha's house for food. Zacchaeus' house for tea. Now it's not Earl Grey, it's for food. It's around connecting with others. He connects around hospitality. I read this quote recently by a lady called Adam Voskamp and she said this, our theology is best expressed in our hospitality. Our theology is best expressed in our hospitality. Do you know, it doesn't take much to flip the kettle on. It doesn't take much to press if you've got a coffee machine or even just to stand outside the cup of tea and talk to your neighbours. One of the most powerful things last year that the communities did was when we all came together to celebrate VE Day. And um, out here where I live, and we live on a, like a cul-de-sac, and as neighbours we celebrated VE Day together and we sat outside and it was nine hours we sat out. Amazingly, the sun was out that day, if you remember. And we had cups of tea and cake and we were stayed socially distant. And later on, people were ordering takeaways and pizzas and the kids drew with um, chalk on the floor. And we connected with our neighbours. The amazing thing is this. A few months earlier, someone had died on our street. And the street were kind of all a little bit knocked by this and there was a little bit of tension about a couple of things. And suddenly as the day happened, as we were talking, as we were chatting, as we were looking into each other's eyes, some of the barriers came down. And each week as we went out on a Thursday night and clapped, we would shout what we were doing to each other and one of the kids would be rattling something or another week a child would be out with half a drum kit or another week of Azaleas we had. But as a community, we came together and welcomed each other. And those relationships are ones that we can build on. And we can ask questions of, hey, can we pray for? Hey, can we connect with? I don't think Jesus is asking you to connect with um, tax collectors. I mean, you might. <laughs> but he's not asking you to connect with people that you don't connect with normally. 
the great things in us that God is doing, he's asking us to be hospitable. And maybe, just maybe, physically in person, that's too much for you right now. And I get that. Maybe a bit more of an introvert. Maybe screen is where you're at. And this is why we have online church, because we want to welcome all, welcome others. You want to be a church where anybody can find a message of hope and anybody can come to faith and just believe in Jesus. Just believe. So do I believe that even greater things than Jesus when it comes to miracles like the big things, the healings, the, uh, I'm still waiting for the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. There are days when I think, okay, let's go. There are days when I'm full of faith and I know God could choose to do that with me in an instant. But also I know this from being a Christian for a very long time now. Actually, these are great things. Defending the cause of the oppressed, speaking hope and welcoming others. These are significant things. God works through us as we step out of ourselves, of our, perhaps sometimes feel a little bit just uncomfortable and it's, oh, I've got to go and talk to someone I wouldn't normally talk to or, oh, okay, God, I'm just going to believe you and say this. Yes, of course, I believe and always will believe in the God of angel armies who's able of, for you to use me to see blind eyes open and walk. I've been in Zambia and seen physical healings and they're incredible. But I also want to be part of a church where we see spiritually people coming back to life, raised to life. That is a miracle. Where we see lives made whole. That is is a miracle where we see family lines generations turn to faith that is a miracle there's a family here in the city that i worked with recently and you know there was 88 in that family that i connected with and the great thing i can't wait to see is the day that i see that family line come to faith because i know that that is incredible and that will generationally make a difference for many, many years to come. So what great thing are you called to? What great thing can you do this week if you just believe and know God works through you? He works in you and through you. Just believe. I'm gonna pray. God, I just wanna thank you that you are on the throne and God, you do do great things. God, I thank you for the challenge of following you. But actually, just call us to just believe. So God, whatever we're struggling with right now, I pray that we believe in you and know with you all things are possible.